Welcome, mortals, creatures of the night, and other unsavory characters. Tonight I have prepared for you a feast for the mind, consisting of three stories of unspeakable terror. So pull up a chair as I serve to you a platter of art horror stories from hell. Greetings, people of the internet. I'm Scott with Cirqueworks Art Labs. Welcome to the underground lair where we create robots, aliens, zombies, and other imminent threats to humanity. Happy Halloween. It is a night of curiosities, ghostly whispers, and things that go bump in the night. A night fitting for the tales I have in store for you. But while I unravel this web of terror, I will be scrawling something equally terrifying. Three sketches of the undead, similar to this one. Abominations that feed on, well, I think you can guess. Just a little food for thought before we begin. Now, in regards to these stories, as uncanny as they may seem, I assure to you that they are all 100% true. How do I know? Because they happen to me. Our first story is entitled, The Dungeon of Despair, and is a first-hand account of a dark prison I once found myself struggling to escape. This story begins in a time where things weren't so bad. I was gainfully employed at a position I rather enjoyed. But all good things must come to an end. I was working as a game designer, creating some popular games that you may have even played. I had worked there for three years, but it seemed the company had taken a downturn and I was informed that my services were no longer needed. So, with my head in my hand, I walked home. What would I do next? Well, I did what any self-respecting artist would do in need of work. I poured over the want ads. If you've ever looked for jobs in the art industry, you know that sometimes they are hard to come by. However, one particular position stuck out. As I read it, I thought, well, this might be something. A designer for a nationally syndicated radio program. I met all the qualifications and I had worked in radio before, so I thought to myself, well, maybe there's something here. So I updated my resume and tailored my cover letter for the position and sent it off into the ether. And to my surprise, I received a call back. They wanted me to come in and interview for the position nothing out of the ordinary, something I have done several times before. So I donned my suit and tie, I went in for the position. And it seemed like I hit it off quite well with the interviewer. I had a few questions as they did as well. I answered their question, but upon my question, I got a curious response. I was wondering was this a new position? Was this a position that somebody had left? What was the history there? And it appeared that they had been having a little trouble keeping this position filled. Apparently, designers kept disappearing. I should have recognized this as a bad omen, but I was in need of work and it couldn't be that bad, could it? 
Famous last words, maybe. In the end, I accepted the position and I was to start the following Monday. I pulled up to the gates of the building, it looming over me. I entered the code that was provided for me and into the parking lot I went. As I entered the building, I was given another code to let me in. And I was informed that I would have to utilize the time car that they provided for me so they knew if I had arrived on time. Something I hadn't really experienced with any other creative position. But this was unlike any creative position I had held ever. They placed an emphasis on punctuation. I was informed that I was to always arrive ahead of schedule and never, never a moment later. Not so much of a problem. I'm quite punctual if need be, but like I said in my past positions, creative jobs were more open to providing an environment suitable for creatives to feel creative, for lack of a better word. But this was a new position and I figured, well, we'll see where it goes, what, what could happen. As I was ushered to the room, the office that I would be working in, I noticed it wasn't like most offices I worked at before. There were no partitions or cubicles. There was just a long, almost never-ending table. It seemed to go on forever. And at that table were a dozen other employees and their respective computer setups, one after the other in a line going around the table. I looked down at their feet, half expecting their legs to be shackled to the floor. So I sat down in front of my computer and started my work. I had a list of assignments that I needed to create ads for their clientele, the listeners of the radio station. This was sort of a tech radio program where they taught mostly senior citizens how to use basic technical features and gadgets. You see, this was an AM radio station and most of the clientele, like I said, were quite older, possibly even on death's door. So, it presented some curious design constraints that I must adhere to. For instance, all type couldn't be less than 24 points, which was a bit, shall we say, limiting. But I digress. I began working away designing the ads, noticing, looking up and seeing cameras all about. You see, the overseers had strict guidelines that mandated you always be working and never, never enjoying yourself. Heaven forbid you had to excuse yourself to use the facilities. You must always ask the overseer's permission to do so. This was the way it was, week after week of soul-sucking task that proved not to be creative at all. But I went on, as I said, I needed the work at the time. The lack of creativity was like nothing I had ever experienced in all my years as an artist, especially coming from a position like I had before where the ideals were work hard, play hard, as long as you completed your assignments. You could exercise your creativity in any manner you wished. And I must say the work being produced was quite creative. To the contrary, the place I was working at at this time, at this place, 
I wondered to myself as I sat there working away, slave to this position, this place, this dungeon of despair. Would I ever escape my mortal coil? And then, upon my three-month anniversary at this position, I was brought into the HR office. As with most positions, I was on a track, a three-month probationary period, where at the end they would assess my work and let me know if I fit the position if I had a future at the company. They were very happy with my work and they agreed to keep me on, but I could not survive there any longer without going insane. You see, I had one last chance to break free, to turn the tables. You see, it wasn't I who was on probation, it was them and I decided I couldn't spend one more week in this prison. Well, that's not actually true. I did spend two more weeks after I gave my notice. I had freed myself. From time to time I would scan the want ads, and I would often see the same posting for the very same position, and I wonder what befell the fate of those who inquired within? Did they too escape? Or were they driven mad? <laughs> Our next tale serves as a warning for any artist who may enter an agreement with another creative soul. Be warned, things are not always as they seem, and sometimes you end up with less than you bargained for. This little morsel is entitled, Beware the Barterer. We begin on an average day, nothing out of the ordinary. That is, until I received a correspondence a friend of a friend, a talented sculptor who I had admired much of his work before. As it were, this artist had a proposition for me, a little trade out. He was starting a new company where he would feature his sculptures and sculpting talents, but he was a sculptor, not necessarily a graphic designer or illustrator. He needed a logo, stationary package, advertising, collateral, you know, the type of things. And since that's what I had done quite a bit of, I thought this would be a unique opportunity to maybe get a sculpture done of one of my characters in return. As I mentioned, I was so impressed with this sculptor's work that the wheels in my head began turning which character would I use. This sculpture was so talented he could recreate any of my characters. But at the time I had one that I particularly liked. A character called Orson from a animated concept that I had been pitching. A bit of a cross between Jason Voorhees and Wile E. Coyote, a funny little man with the hockey mask who, although he had aspirations of homicidal, maniacal destruction, they always seemed to backfire on himself. Kind of a funny character, as I said. Not too complicated. Surely this sculpture who was like years ahead of what I could do. I had maybe dabbled a bit in sculpture here and there, but nothing to this degree. So I leapt at the opportunity. I set work creating various logo designs, and I poured my heart into them. He was very impressed. It seemed like he wanted to use all of them, but of course you have to settle on one, which he did. 
and I continued to create all the, as I said, collateral material that went along with that logo. It was quite a lot of work, but it would have been worth it for what I would get in return. Hence, I delivered the necessary files to the sculptor, and I waited, and waited. Periodically, I would ask for a progress report on the sculptor, and he said he was working on it, or he hadn't got quite to it yet. There were a few different excuses. This went on for what seemed like months. I didn't want to nag, I'm sure he was busy, but after all, I completed my end of the bargain. Then he informed me that yes, he was working on it and it was coming along quite well and my enthusiasm grew as I waited to see what this master sculptor would come up with. But the project seemed to drag and drag and drag and there was no sign of any progress. I hadn't received any photographs. He said that he'd rather finish the whole project. And I understand this. Sometimes when you present unfinished work, it's hard for people to wrap their head around what the actual finished project would be. But time went on and I became more and more impatient. I would call every week asking, what's going on here? You're using the logo, I see, but I don't have my sculpture yet, and for all intents and purposes, this wasn't a difficult project. I might have even been able to do it on my own, probably not to the extent that this sculptor could do. He was used to doing very figurative, very detailed work, and this was a cartoon character, just a maquette that I wanted. Soon he informed me that yes, he was going to be sending me the project. So I waited. And within a week I received a box on my doorstep. I was positively giddy. I brought the package inside. I couldn't wait to see what was in the box. As I pulled away the tape and opened the cardboard flap to see what was inside, I... No, it couldn't be. What before my eyes would appear was the severed head of my beloved character. I thought, well, what? Could it have been broken? But no, it was never attached to begin with. The whole sculptor was in pieces. But there's more. The remaining figure was twisted and contorted and deformed, clearly unfinished from an artist unwilling to adequately fulfill his end of the bargain. But why would he? He already got what he wanted from me. I learned a valuable lesson on that day. There are artists in this world with incredible talents, but talent without integrity is a wasted gift. And that is where the remains of the sculpture lie today. Wasted, rotting in an underground crypt under a pile of refuse, never to see the light of day. <laughs> Our final course is perhaps the hardest to swallow. I'm not sure if you will even believe me. Nevertheless, I must persist. I hope you have saved room because I have saved the best for last. I present to you, dear viewer, the beast in the night. One of the things that always weighed on me as an artist was my inability to keep a sketchbook. Sure, I have completed many sketches in my tenure as an artist, but they were all done on loose sheets of parchment. Nothing nicely bound, nothing that I would consider a collection. So I made the decision. 
I was going to finally complete a sketchbook. I decided on something small and portable that I could always have with me on hand, perhaps in my back pocket. I would take the sketchbook wherever I went and if I had the opportunity I would scrawl in it. At the end of the day I would set my sketchbook on the mantel next to my bed with my keys, wallet and other belongings. This went on for weeks, perhaps even a month, without incident, until one night I would wake up to find my sketchbook slightly askew. Seems odd, but I didn't think much of it. I would go about my days. Some nights it would be uneventful. And then others I would wait to find it lying on the floor. Strange. Did I knock it over in my slumber? Perhaps, but I decided not to dwell too much on that. After all, it could have been any number of things. I continued my daily routine, out and about, pulling out my sketchbook from time to time, drawing what I usually draw. Creatures, monsters, robots, like I said in the beginning imminent threats to humanity, all of that good stuff. And as I said at the end of each night, I would set my sketchbook like I always did, along with my other belongings. Until one night, while I lay sleeping, I heard something, a gnawing sound. What was this? Was it a dream? The sounds grew louder and more pronounced, but I was in a deep sleep. It faded in and out. In the night I tossed and turned. In my mind's eye I saw a vision of a hideous beast. Its long and yellow fangs, the stuff of nightmares. Its matted ghostly white fur appearing briefly then vanishing before my weary eyes. Its foul stench permeating throughout my dreams. I awoke in a cold sweat, and through the corner of my vision I could have sworn I saw a glimpse of the creature, even though I swear to you I was fully awake. I reached for my belongings, grabbed my keys, my wallet, but my sketchbook was nowhere to be found. I sprung for my bed, and what I saw will chill you to the bone my sketchbook lie on the floor. It had been torn apart, ravaged by the beast. All of my work destroyed, my dreams of finally finishing a sketchbook destroyed, never to be seen again. The grisly scene was horrible, I tell you. I couldn't believe it. But what? What if the beast was still around? I was so concerned with my artwork. I didn't know was I in mortal danger. Cautiously, I looked around the corners of my home. Where was the beast? Was it still there? Was it hiding away? Perhaps I'll never know. Then again, maybe the creature was there all along, waiting for the most opportune time to show himself. You may ask yourself, what of the beast? I know you probably think I'm mad, but it's true. Every word, and I have the evidence to prove it. I was able to capture the creature on film. I warn you, what I am about to show you is not for the faint of heart. So prepare yourself for the beast. <laughs> I 
There you have it. I hope you have enjoyed these twisted tales of artist creations gone awry. I'm sure I'm not the only one who has experienced the dark side of life as a working artist. You may have your own stories. So if you would, be so kind as to share them in the comments section. And until next time, Happy Halloween. That is all. Hey, thanks for watching. If you like what you saw and you want to see more, hit that subscribe button. Also, you can follow me at CircWorks on social media, and now you can support the work that I do on Patreon. Do you like making comics? Then go to CircWorks.com and pick up the Comic Maker Starter Kit. It's packed full of fonts, brushes, templates, and more. And best of all, it's totally free.